Welcome back to a live edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, as always, Christopher Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest into the show today. He is currently running to be the next leader of the United Conservative Party here in the province of Alberta, and ultimately the next premier of this province as well, Dr. Raj Sherman. Dr. Raj, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Chris, thank you for the invite. It's an honor to be here, and everybody out there, I appreciate you taking the time to spend some time here with us. I, I guess I should have asked you this beforehand in our pre-interview, but do you mind if I call you Raj, or how would you like no, to be best? Mr. Raj Sherman, is, Dr. No, Sherman? No, Raj is good. <laughs> Raj is good. Awesome. Um, I've started all my interviews off with every political candidate for any position, or former candidate, former politician, the same way, you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, it uh, probably came from my par parents and my grandparents. You know, they were born into a country where there was no freedom. My, my mother is a strong woman, and she played a very integral role in my life. My mother was in the house when the Queen's uncle, Lord Mountbatten, negotiated the independence of India with her grandfather and their friends. And so I was born into a refugee village in India in 65. My parents had to flee because uh, the division of northern India was done when Pakistan was created. Yeah. You know, if you're one religion, you had to go to one side. It was a horrible time in human history. So I was raised in a humble area by really strong people who believed in a sense of personal responsibility for the country. And, and the freedom was achieved without fighting a war. It was the negotiations. They told the British, stay here, guide us. So yeah, democracy is very important to, to my family and, and, so and to the, and the country that I grew up in. What got you involved in politics here in Canada, though? Because that's the ultimate question that a lot of people are looking at their politicians today is, why can we trust you to lead us through this, uh, uh, this, this world that we currently reside in? So why did you decide, as a doctor, to get into politics? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I myself am and was just as cynical as everybody else about politics here. What? Um, what are you talking about? People aren't cynical about <laughs> politics, are they? You know, in 2004, I was a single parent working God knows how many shifts in an emergency, flying with stars. And I have a construction company on the side, I'm coaching my kids' basketball and soccer teams, and I'm playing my own sports. I was a busy guy. And I was invited to a meeting by doctor colleagues of mine, and uh, the Alberta Medical Association were having meetings. I went to the washroom when I came out. I was elected the head emergency doctor in the province. <laughs> so this is literally how it started. So what you're saying is don't leave a room when an election's going on. <laughs> yeah. And we had a healthcare crisis because uh, a million people showed up to Alberta because of the oil boom in a very short period of time. You know, we had the crisis. I started working in ER in 1992 in an inner city ER in Edmonton at the Royal Alec Hospital. And we were all family doctors and the residency started. So I was the first residency trained to MERS doc from the Edmonton program. I guess I'm sort of the Arnold Schwarzenegger, the, the T-100 Terminator model of ER docs in Edmonton. But it was in crisis and, uh, and we always said, look, it's not the ER crisis when the ER is in crisis. It's a system issue and a societal issue. You know, societal people didn't have houses, homelessness, poverty, addictions, mental health, violence in the streets. That all comes to the Royal Alec ER in the inner city. I mean, the system issues, nobody had a family doctor. So people didn't get a checkup for, for a week, and now they were so sick, we had to care for them and admit them to hospital. Hospitals were plugged up by seniors that didn't need to be there. There's no accountability. So we went on an advocacy campaign to educate and advocate society, the people who ran the system, and politicians. And I rendered to Dave Hancock, and uh, he was the minister at the time. I go, Dave. Geez, you sound like a pretty nice conservative. I thought you guys were all scary. And he said, Raj, we want, I want this problem fixed. And uh, he listened to us. We gave him evidence-based solutions. And Minister Hancock, he's a judge now. He convinced me to run for public office. Uh, on two weeks' notice, I ran for a nomination. I knew nothing about politics. So and here we are. You, you have been a public figure for some time. People will know who you are from your time as a PCMLA, as the time as the Alberta Liberal uh, leader. Uh, you have left politics, but you've decided there's a calling. You need to come back. You need to run for the position of UCP leader and ultimately the next premier of Alberta. Um, I wanted to ask the million-dollar question, why you, why now? Well, one, uh, health is in crisis. There are many other systems. COVID-19 has been a game changer. Our economy was in the boots, and after COVID hit, 
healthcare is worse than it ever was when I first ran in 2006. First time around, I was the parliamentary assistant to two health ministers, three CEOs, and uh, or three deputy ministers and five CEOs in healthcare. And our government made certain decisions that weren't good. And uh, the creation of HS, I didn't support how it was created and the implementation of it. It led to a bigger crisis than when I first ran. And back then, I blew the whistle on my government. I said, look, people are dying in the waiting rooms. My dad was one of them who almost died a number of times. God bless his soul, he did die eventually. And I said, I, government was a threat to public safety. So I became an independent member for a year. And that was the best year because I got to work with every political party. I didn't have to listen to a leader or a party and just parrot their speaking notes. I could be myself and do my job as an MLA, which is really, my bosses were my constituents. Yeah. And it bothered me that you had to vote the same way all the time with 70 people on 100 issues. That's not possible. And votes were ripped. That really bothered me a lot. You know, then Dr. Swan had resigned, Premier Stelmach resigned. So I became the liberal leader. I was the outsider conservative, me and a handful of friends. We came in from the outside. We inspired a lot of people to join the Alberta Liberal Party at that time. Um, you know, they, were, they went to 30,000 members and supporters. Yeah. 25,000 were mine. And uh, really humbled to receive that support on first ballot. As outsider, we came in. We worked with the Liberal Caucus, brought in something they didn't have, which was government experience. We said, look, let's not criticize everything government does because if we formed government, we'd probably do 80% of what they're doing. What they're sort of doing right, we can improve. What they're, when they're really off base, oh yeah, we will, we will embarrass them and we will also provide solutions at the same time. You know, Lori Blakeman, uh, Kent Hare, Dr. David Swan, Darshan Kong, Kang, yeah. really good MLAs. They, I couldn't have done this job without them. As an outsider, we were able to stay together as a team, succeed, and uh, ac accomplish good things. So yeah. I lived a lifetime in politics, and uh, a lot of that work, because of COVID and other issues, has been undone. And uh, I'm older and wiser, and my kids said, Dad, you got to get back in. So, so it goes to the question then, why now? What, what, what is it about this? Like We talked about the healthcare system being undone, but why the UCP? Because I think there's a lot of people out there who are looking at you and going, okay, you're a PC, you're an independent, you were a liberal MLA, but now you are wanting to run for the UCP. What is it about the UCP that drew you to that party, to that you said, you know what, that's where my home is now. My home is the UCP, and there's a lot of Albertans out there who are looking for a home, and they would find it under a Sherman's UCP government. You know, I've always been pretty, many people have criticized me because I've gone to different parties. One is a leader. I've always been a fiscal conservative. I'm Indian. <laughs> my mother has played a very big influence in my life and managing money properly. And secondly, people need jobs. You can't pay for anything. if you, Nothing's getting paid for if nobody's working. No taxes are being paid at personal level and at the corporate level. Um, socially, I've been very open. Socially, I'm a progressive. I've always been socially progressive and fiscally conservative. In fact, when I was liberal leader, we literally moved the Liberal Party to the center, center right. We literally changed the colors to blue and red. I've been open. I've been a Paul Martin liberal and Lawrence Decor liberal and Premier Lougheed conservative and Ed Stalmack conservative. To me, there's actually no difference in the values. The values are the same now. There's a leadership race. So I represent the former progressive conservative voice or the blue liberal voice I'm a moderate when it comes to social values, and I'm a fiscal conservative. But and there will be some people, and I apologize to interrupt, but i got to ask this question, because the UCP is the party of two parties, the PCs and the Wild Rose. How would you be able to balance the united conservative party? Because there is concerns that there are two fractions in the party, and this is why we're in the position where we are with the UCP, is because both sides weren't getting along. Why do you think you'd be able to unify the party to ensure that you guys win the next election and ultimately beat Rachel Notley? You know, uh, we already did a dry run of this when I was Liberal leader. I was the outsider who came in and, you know, they're quite strong with the environmental policy, very left on environmental policy. And uh, I talked to them, I explained to them, hey, certain things ha need to change. Certain things will keep the same. Now, as an independent, I worked with Danielle Smith on issues of fiscal accountability and economy. And she was a Wild Rose leader. Even as liberal leader, 
I had no trouble working with Danielle Smith and my Wild Rose brothers and sisters in the legislature on those issues. And I had no difficulty working even with my new Democrat friends on social issues that made sense. So, you know, when you're in that soft center, you can, you know, it's sort of like being a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> and still maintaining your values. Um, like, hey, Danielle and I will get along here and... Rachel Notley and I will get along on, on some sort of so, social, social issues. I'm not really far left on social issues. I'm not there. And I'm not really far right on economic issues. I met a Do you number think Albertans of, are looking for that? Do you think Albertans think so. are looking for a centered option? Because, Absolutely. Really? I think most Albertans politically are sitting where I'm sitting. Most people are. And I think most people aren't voting right now because they're frustrated of far left and far right politics. And in fact... I met with a bunch of rural MLAs way before I decided to run. And they said, how would you deal with these issues? I said, real simple. The same way I dealt with it when I was in the Liberal Party. You know, Kent here and Lori Blakeman was quite far left. I said, guys, you get a free vote on the floor of the House. Vote for your constituents. Your job is to vote for your constituents. They're your bosses, not me. The leader is a servant. I said, the difference between your vote and my vote, when you're the leader, as Liberal leader, I'm concerned about what's going on with people in Two Hills or Cardston or Raymond or Peace River. Yes, Edmonton and Calgary. As a leader, you're responsible for 4.3 million people, whether they voted for you or not. When I was a junior minister, I considered the health of every Alberta my personal responsibility. This is why I spoke out against my government, said, hey, I know firsthand people are dying and suffering. They don't need to. And our government's lying to you. So... Being an independent, I would ask my MLAs to be more independent of the leader in the party. And in fact, I told them I would expect that you would have a voting record. Vote for your constituents. You'll have a voting record. Because really, you're leader of nothing if you don't have 45 people elected on your team. And so the rural MLAs were sort of shocked. I go, you guys don't have a chance to vote your conscience and vote for your constituents? They go, no. We have to vote the same way. And... Well, I think it's pretty clear what happened recently. The Premier was pushed out by his own political party. You, you mentioned something that I want to go back to, if you don't mind, here for a few minutes, and that is the urban-rural divide that this province has seen. Um, I, I worked in uh, rural, northern rural Alberta, and I can tell you that the people in rural communities believe that they are getting shortchanged. And I mean that with all respect because we do have an active listenership up in uh, Lesser Slave Lake area, Peace River area, high, uh, high level area. And what I hear over and over again from former friends from up there, not former friends, but friends from up there is Edmonton and Calgary always get looked after and the rural communities always get uh, the, 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 the chump change, the stuff left over and no one really wants. How do you change that? Because you talked about having... 47 or 67 uh, independent voices in a caucus. But would nothing get done in that situation? Because you would need to unify a party and actually kind of say, okay, guys, we need to vote for health care in this area because it's important. But if the person down in Medicine Hat's constituent says, well, they're not getting uh, health care in my community, so I don't want you to vote for that. How do you bring together rural and urban divide with independent voices and independent votes every single time. You know, my people think I run to fix health care. Yeah. My number one issue, actually, is to uniting people. Yeah. COVID has really divided us. Family members have fired family members. Best friends have fired best friends. And uh, I'm sort of in the middle of this discussion here. You know, there have been lots of harm from lockdowns. Two years of delayed care. The mental health issues. Economic issues. Absolutely. Then there are the harms of COVID getting out of control and plugging up the acute care system. We had way too many people die, way too many people suffer. When we had eleven to 1,600 admissions in the hospital from COVID, not only there was that direct suffering, but then there was all those people who didn't get the care that they needed because we were already running a system at 98% capacity. So I'm asking everyone, please, put down your shields and your spears and your swords. We're in this together. Urban, rural, we're in this together. And I've heard that urban folks say the same thing about rural folks. They got everything the way they got it, great roads and all the industrial tax base. I said, I'm hearing the same thing from all of you. We need to communicate with one another and get to know one another. 
How do you do that, though? Because um, politician, as a politician, there is a apprehensive to trust politicians, to even open up to politicians. And on this show, we try to break down that barrier and just say, hey, this person puts on his pants the same way that I do. And he's just a person and he's a human being. He's infallible. Every or she's infallible. How do you break down that communication and start having that conversation? Because we are in a more politically divided world than we have ever been. And why do you, you talk about your time as the liberal leader, but during your time as a liberal leader, it, we are more divided than we are then. So why do you think right now, right here, 2022, Ron Sherman is the best candidate to unify all Albertans to start having that conversation and say, we have more that unites us than divides us. You know, I don't know if I'm the best candidate. There's a lot of good candidates running. Uh, but you put but, your name forward, so you believe yeah. you're the best candidate. But my, my whole life has been overcoming indifference and intolerance. You know, I was a colored man in the 1970s in Squamish, a redneck log in town, and I wasn't made to feel welcome. I overcame that and overcame our differences, and we came to realize we were the same. I spent my summers in 1985 in Camp Carolina at a Baptist camp. You know, the Mr. Keekstra and Zundel were teaching certain stuff down the street, and KKK were having rallies down the streets of uh, Calgary in the early 1980s. I spent my whole time in life dealing with conflict and bringing peace and being a mediator. You know, I think what we need to do is we need to listen to one another. We need to be empathetic towards one another's cause. And if we can put on the other person's shoes and just change spots, and you realize we're actually all saying the same thing. As a doctor... I can say this because I have looked after 100,000 patients and then some from all over the province, whether you're urban or rural. So when COVID hit, I told my urban brothers and sisters, I said, look guys, they don't have any family doctors in rural Alberta. Because of a lot of misinformation, many people in rural Alberta were afraid of getting vaccinated. Like Ryan Jesperson said, aren't you mad, Raj? But Ryan, how can I get mad at somebody that's suffering and who's, been, who's a victim? People were dying in front of us. Then suddenly they wanted the vaccine when, before we put the tube in. And if we put the tube in on the ventilator, 50% chance you're going to die. And if you live, you're going to be on that tube for a long time. How can you get mad at a human being that's suffering in front of you? And secondly, there are victims of misinformation. I was upset at the doctors who were spreading in misinformation. I wasn't upset at the patient. So what happens in Two Hills affects us in Edmonton and the health system. And what happens to us in Edmonton? If we have seniors plugging up at the hospital in Edmonton and poor homeless folks that are on the street that are drug addicted, you know, with meth and fentanyl crisis that we have in the streets of Edmonton, if they're in hospital, you can't come into the hospital from rural Alberta when you need that specialized care. We're all in this together. And I'm a small town boy who grew up in rural India, rural British Columbia. Yeah, I live in the big city now, but I spent my whole life caring for and comforting, sometimes curing. Uh, people from all over the province. And that's something that different that I bring, and I'm not a politician. You have uh, been crisscrossing this province. You were just in Medicine Hat, Lethbridge. You are going back up to Edmonton. You're making a stop here for the show, so we thank you so much for that. But I want to ask the question that uh, is on everyone's minds, that's particularly on my mind right now, is um, what are you hearing? Because... We see candidates in this race who are talking about autonomy, separation, sovereignty. But what are you hearing from Albertans? What are you hearing from the membership of the UCP? Because that will inform my next line of questioning. So what are you hearing from Albertans? Well, you know, you hear, well, once you're, once you're in politics, you hear all sorts <laughs> of issues. And, and uh, you know, I was in Panoka, Town Hall in Panoka. I sat at the back of the room in Danielle uh, Smith's Town Hall in Raymond yesterday. Um we're hearing everything. Number one, people don't trust politicians and government. The COVID thing has been a big divider. People are cynical. Um, economy's big, been an issue. You know, this boom and bust cycle has been very difficult for pe people. Access to health care. The ambulance doesn't show up for an hour. And if you go to an emergency, you're waiting six or eight hours when you're suffering. People can't get a family doctor. Rural Alberta people are concerned that AHS is not working for them. Education's an issue, you know. You talk to families with children. You know, some families are worried about not enough choice in the public system, especially when you're a conservative. They want more choice in the education system. Uh, in urban Alberta, you're hearing about the cutbacks to, to post-secondary, 15% to the universities. Tuition's going up. 
Our seniors aren't getting the supports that they need to live their lives with dignity and respect. And uh, you know the cost of inflation. Look at the high cost of food. The cost of putting food on the table. And have you see, checked your electricity bill lately? The fees? Your done. furnace is off, but your fees are through the roof. Your yeah. lights are off, but the fees are through the roof. And the cost of gas. It cost 180 bucks to... It cost me 178 bucks to fill up my pickup truck. Wow. So I can afford it, but I know many regular Albertans are really struggling, and my brothers aren't. You know, my brothers, uh, my one's an electrician, one's a stay-at-home dad. I know my brothers are struggling as are their neighbors. I want to play in some of these sandboxes if you want to play with them, in them was with me, and I want to start with the one that has been the pinnacle point of your campaign, healthcare. How do we fix a crumbling system that is so overloaded right now. We see nurses being uh, put on a mental leave because they've been struggling. We are seeing doctors who are leaving Alberta because they just feel tired and they're going to somewhere else to get more money, better wages, or more uh, better service, or better uh, atmosphere for doctors. How do we fix a system? And I know that's a big question in a very short time that I'm going to give you, but I want to know what's the first step? What is the first step that we can fix our healthcare system so we aren't so overwhelmed in the future, but also right now? Chris, a rabbi once told me, don't use the word fix because no one's going to believe you. <laughs> right, now, love it. Okay. right now, the system is damaged. You know, I even asked myself, one, first of all, one person can't do it. It's going to require the collective effort of everybody. What leadership needs to do is stop lying to the people. Throw all those communications notes in the damn garbage. Admit that we got a crisis on our hands. Let's stop blaming anyone for the crisis. COVID has been a game changer. This is a national and international problem. We have two years of delayed care. No one got a checkup. I didn't get a checkup, and I'm a doctor. I couldn't see my own doctor for two years. And uh, I barely got to see mine, and I had cancer during the well, two years. Oh, I'm so years. sorry to hear that. Yeah, and, so. and, and, and that's a story that, that you hear too, too, too common, commonly. Staff are burnt out. Many are leaving the province, or many my age are retiring early. My daughter's a young family doctor with a recent government thing about forcing them to go to small towns. They're leaving the province. They're not planning to make Alberta their own home. They're going to the U.S. So staff are leaving practice at a time when the need is great. First thing we need to do, admit we have a crisis and a problem. That's number one. Number two, we must immediately sign all the contracts with everybody. The Alberta Medical Association, their contract are ripped up. Don't give them everything they're asking. They want respect. That's what the doctors want. They want respect. They want to be treated as equal partners in a system that they're going to work in versus some politician running it. AUPE doesn't have a contract. HSAA doesn't have a contract. Um, you know, the, the nurses have a contract, but let's sign all the contracts so we can give reassurance. We have a massive surplus coming. Reassurance to all the frontline staff who literally put their lives at risk during this deadly virus. I was sick as a dog for a month, Chris, before vaccine, November 2020. I didn't get out of my condo for a month. I was so sick. Staff literally put their, we need to acknowledge their efforts. In fact, even go and give them a bit of a bonus, but at least sign the contract. And secondly, now we can retain the staff we have, show them love and respect. We can attract new staff. Now, it's a crisis. What I'm gonna say is gonna be a bit controversial. I think we need to dissolve the AHS board. They're all politically appointed by the NDP and the Conservatives. We need to put in an interim administrator who's an expert who will put together a team of healthcare experts from across the country, across the world, and right here from Alberta. We need to put former deputy ministers and AHS CEOs on the board. Uh, we need to put the Health Quality Council on the new emergency board. I would put the deans of the medical schools there. I would put the reg regulatory bodies there, the College of Physicians, Surgeons, and CARNA, and the regulatory bodies of the other professions, pharmacists, and uh, the allied health professionals. Let's put the unions as non-voting members. Everyone has something to contribute. And let's put the municipal leaders from AUMA. If I was the premier, that would be my health board, not somebody who's my buddy, who's appointed by because they donated to my campaign and they were nice to me. There'd be people who actually are concerned about the community and they can play a role. If I told you that 15 to 20 percent of hospitals' bleds were plugged up by people who shouldn't be there, like seniors or homeless, what would you do, Chris, or anybody else out there? You'd say, let's get them out. 
I would be honest. I would say, uh, let's get those people out. But also, if I knew... So, and I'll, I'll be honest here, and I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from your st story, but during the first year after I was diagnosed with cancer and I was going through radiation and chemo, um, there were days when I would not go to the hospital because I would not want to overwhelm the hospital system. So I would sit in my house and suffer having seizures, having moments when I wouldn't be able to move, move my legs. And, I, and I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. Like, I would love to have said that I would have loved to have gone to the hospital, which I would have, but COVID was running rampant. We did not know all the details. And I sat here and I said, it's already overwhelmed and I can't put myself in danger where I'm potentially taking up a bed which someone is going to die from COVID if it happens. So, and... That's what I would say. Well, th this is the issue. Many good Albertans don't want to be a burden. And then when you present, they present really late. Yeah. When you present late, you suffer a lot more. And now we have a lot more work to do. If you're not feeling well, you go to a hospital or call 911. The ambulance should show up within eight minutes, 19 times out of 20. If you go to emergency, you should, if it's a, we're dealing okay with cardiac arrests and knifings and stabbings and massive trauma. Yeah. But if you go show up with a headache, chest pain, belly pain, unless it's a massive heart attack, you're waiting anywhere from four to eight hours. And many people are leaving without treatment. When they leave without treatment, they come back if they're sick. Heck of a lot sicker. If it's something fatal, you know what? I got mortician friends of mine telling me that, you know what? They called the hearse because the ambulance didn't show up for an hour and a half. So the system is dangerous right now. Dr. Paul Parks He's AMA president-elect. He's been on the radio and TV all over the place. I agree with him. Okay? So the way to do this is, let's get the seniors out and let's stop them from coming in. Let's invest quickly, swiftly in home care, seniors, community supports. We got to work with the municip municipal leaders. Heck, we could rent a, a bunch of hotels tomorrow. Let's rent a bunch of hotels tomorrow in Edmonton and Calgary where all the big hospitals are and let's just hire the staff. It only costs 150 bucks a room. They clean the room. Let's embed the staff. We don't need to build any buildings right now. We can get the, these folks out, get the support. Now a hospital can function as a hospital. Yeah. People who are admitted to emergency for a day or two or three days can now go up. And now we can take the sick person off the ambulance stretcher and out of the waiting room in. It's not the sore throat and runny nose going to emergency caused the crisis. It's we got 60 beds in the back. 30, 40 are plugged up by people who should have been upstairs two days ago. But they can't go up because grandma and grandpa and some homeless folk is plugging up that bed. We can do this tomorrow. Work with the hotel industry and get these folks out. Secondly, we need family doctors. We need lots of them. The government passed a bill called Bill 25 telling young doctors they have to go to rural Alberta. My daughter's one of them. Prior to this bill, 85% of young doctors' residents were going to stay in Alberta. Now, 75% of are planning on leaving to either British Columbia or Saskatchewan or you know what the United States is coming here picking off all our staff all over again nurses and, and doctors you name it they're flying them down there first class flights they're whining and dining them and they're not paying them with funny funny money like us Canadians have they're paying them real American dollars so this is a problem we must reverse that legislation tell the young doctors we love them sign the contract they're going to get paid and we want them to stay here serve the community that they grew up in we have a whole bunch of our young doctors who have left the country, who educated elsewhere. Ireland, Australia, uh, Bahamas. The government cut post-secondary education by 15% because the economy was bad. We have money now. Let's invest in the assessments, practice assessments in the medical schools to get these folks working and into the system. We have foreign docs here. The real solution actually is rural medical schools, training family doctors in Lethbridge, in Grand Prairie, in... Um, Fort McMurray, in Red Deer, in Medicine Hat, training the whole healthcare team there. When young people train together in a, in, in, together when they're really young, they hook up. They find somebody and they hook up. And they're going to make that place their home. 70% of the time, they're going to live and work within 70 miles of where they live. This is how you fix healthcare. And lastly, accountability. There needs to be some accountability. You need somebody who understands healthcare. I said, if you can't fix healthcare, you can't govern this province. It's 50% of human spend. All 45 to 50 percent of all spending in every government. If you can't run healthcare, you can't govern and be the premier of this province. I can put together a team that can fix or drastically improve healthcare really quickly. 
I want to I want to talk about rural doctors here for like two seconds, and then we're going to move on to our second last uh, topic before we wrap up here, and that is uh, rural doctors. Uh, municipalities are taking upon themselves to attract rural doctors to their areas. I, I worked for a municipality that had a doctor recruitment program that they would fly doctors into their community, show them around. Hey, look what we have! We have a mall. We have this, that, and the other. We have one Tim Hortons because that's what they needed to do to show up because they felt like the provinces weren't doing enough. Um, how do you, how would you work with municipalities to attract rural doctors? Because we want it. We want to make sure that they go there. They we want to make sure we have that r- rural f- uh, physician in those communities. But they go in, they stay there for five years, and then they leave because well, I can go make more money down in Edmonton or Calgary or in a larger city than Hannah or uh, Raymond. How do we do that? How do we work with our municipalities to attract those doctors? Or would you say the province needs to take that responsibility on for itself? You know, that's a Robin Peter to pay Paul. <coughs> that's essentially what we're doing. Shuffle deck chairs on the Titanic. It's a very expensive band-aid. Mm-hmm. And frankly, it's been 30 years. And it's not working. The way to do this is bring our kids back. <coughs> First of all, the kids that we're currently training, the government made a mistake in passing that law. I would reverse that law. Encourage our current kids that we're training to stay here and serve our province. Secondly, bring our kids back from across the world to work in rural areas. Sign a two-year contract so that we'll give them their medical license. We have a lot of foreign trained doctors. You know, the joke is we've got the most educated taxi fleet on the planet. We have foreign trained doctors that are here right now. Let's see if they can get up to our our standards. If they can't, we got to invest in their education, re-education to our standards. And let's get them working and get and say you know what you got to go rural for a couple of years but the real long-term solution is rural health schools yeah and that's the real long-term solution so there's short and one thing we can do immediately another thing is let's hire every nurse practitioner into the primary care networks to work alongside doctors and let's hire nurses in emergency i was a small town family doc when i started in er there was no specialty we were all family docs I do what I'm trained to do as a doctor, highly trained to diagnose and make the treatment plan. We write it down, we give it to the team. We work such a fantastic professional team to execute the plan. Let's get the doctors in the community who do that hard work of family medicine, geriatric medicine, mental health medicine, pediatric medicine. This is tough medicine, hard work. And it doesn't pay a lot either uh, compared to some of my other colleagues. Let's get them the team in the community to do that job. So let's invest heavily in the primary care networks. You know what I would do? You really want to fix healthcare long term? Yeah. Let's put an ATCO trailer in every school parking lot, and let's put a, a school nurse, a mental health counselor, physical, physical activity counselor, and let's connect the primary care network to there. Because let's stop a glut of illness that's coming down the pipeline. It's not the seniors, it's their kids and grandkids getting their disease in their 20s and 30s. We got 20 year olds with type 2 diabetes and hypertension and obesity. And we can manage this for 60 years, the cost of managing it. So let's work on the prevention side of the system. Uh, when, the, when the kids are young, let's get them eating healthy, moving more, addressing these things early. When young people turn 18, we got a baby boom. And guess what? They get fired by the pediatrician. And they are last in line in the adult health system. And we got so many young people right now dealing with mental health issues and medical issues. And they got nobody to care for them. And that's why let's connect these primary care networks to the school system via nurse practitioner, via the school nurse and the mental health counselor. This is how we do it. It can be done. But it will require leadership, leadership that understands the problem, and a commitment in funding this. Speaking of funding, I want to turn to the big other big topic that I want to talk about today, and that is inflation. You talked about it earlier in your statement a few minutes ago, and you know that people are struggling right now. People are struggling with high gas prices, high, high food prices, high electricity prices. People are struggling. We can't wait. And I, I've said this to every single candidate who's come on here. We can't wait for a solution in October or even later. We need a solution today. Um, while you're not leader right now and you're running to be the leader, what can we do to help Canadian or Albertans, I should say, from 
from here in Calgary, Edmonton, up in Fort Vermilion, in Banff, in uh, uh, Vermilion. What can we do right now as a government, as the UCP government? If you were talking to Jason Kenney right now, what would you say to him to do to get this issue fixed, but also help Albertans who are struggling? Chris, you know what? Uh my mom and dad, dad worked in the mill, mom cleaned toilets and hotel rooms, and they had four boys in a small town where we grew up. And mom and dad struggled through this regularly. The days when the milkman used to drop some milk at the door, and you get a little bit of money in the mail for your children if you had children. That made a huge difference for my parents into getting us clothing. And, you know, it was cheap clothing. You know, my mom would negotiate with the people at the field store and the sand store. Um, we got to help families out people that are struggling, because if they can't afford to stay in their homes, they can't afford to feed their children, you're going to end up ill, you're going to end up sick, and you're going to end up in the emergency department where I work. This is why I'm running. I told my children, I said, I've seen enough. Enough is enough. I'm fed up. i got to get back into public office. And we have a big surplus coming. Well, let's help families out with that surplus. Okay? Let's help get down the cost of the bills. Let's find out why our electricity bills are so high. While we work on the reason why it's so high, but let's give you a little supplement to help reduce the cost of your bill. You know, regular working folk, they don't live in the middle of the city. They got to live on the outsides and they don't have the fancy Tesla. So their cost of gas is going to be huge to go to work and take the kids to sports and go to the grocery store. Let's help you out with the gas bills. Let's, let's reduce the taxes that we can. And I believe the government did do something to reduce the cost, at least gas, but it's still too expensive. Cost of groceries and clothing. Well, let's give... Family, work, families, some rebates with that as well. So we have the money. It's the people's money. The money that comes in from other oil and gas, it's the people's money. It's not one premier's money. It wouldn't be my money if I'm premier. It's not mine or my MLA friends. It's your money. You're struggling. Let's give it to you. Like, guys like me don't need it, by the way. I don't need it. Don't give it to guys like me. Okay? I got more than enough. In fact, I should be donating some of my money that I currently have, and I, which I am, personally. But let's give it to those who are truly struggling and those who are, you know, falling behind the poverty line. The moral test of a government is how you, you know, treat those in the twilight of their life, the children, those in the dawn of their life, the elderly, and those who walk in the shadows of life, you know, the sick, the handicapped, the disabled. This is that time for us as Albertans. And I believe the life that I've lived, working in inner city hospital, Alberta needs an empathetic leader who whose heart bleeds for you. I was not going to ask this question, but we did have a question come in. He's listening via the audio show on their website right now. Jonathan, I don't know his last name, all of this is Jonathan. He wants to know, I'm going to read this here, what is your position on the current K-6 through curriculum, and would you overturn it? You know, my belief has always been, you got to talk to the people that do the work. And you got to talk to the people who are affected by the work. We need to review the decision. Yes, it's very important. Parents should have a say in what the children should learn, as should students. But you know what? Teachers, they're doing the teaching. They've got to be at the table. They have to be, as well as some international experts, because we got to see for our educational system if we're on par with what the rest of the world is going to be. Because at the end of the day, societies that out-educate us today are going to outperform us tomorrow. And the same thing goes with the health system. The nurses need to be involved and the doctors need to be involved. You know what? The most important person in the health system is the unit clerk and the environmental services folks. They'll tell you how to fix the health system. They see it all. So I've always been a believer, if you want to fix anything, you want to make any change, the leader has to sit down with the experts, which is the people doing the work and the people using the work, which is the students and the family. So I simply think this could have been a better decision. And if I'm given the privilege to govern and and serve this province on October 6th as Premier, we will review a lot of these decisions that where Albertans feel that they weren't done properly. And you know what? The government did do a lot of good things as well. Red tape reduction was fantastic. We're in a surplus position, despite how challenged our economy was. So Travis Taves did a great job of balancing the budget, and I got a good Premier uh, Kenny uh, credit there as well. There are other th decisions that I would review. Uh, the, the education decision would be one of them. Well, I want to ask one last question, then we'll turn to the wrap-up here, uh, Raj. And that is, um, this is more of a personal question, just for my own clarification. Um, hypothetically, you don't win this uh, a leadership race. 
will you run for the UCP or will you run for a nomination in the upcoming 2023 uh, Alberta provincial election, even if you don't win? You know, that question has been asked to me by many MLAs. Okay, good I said, to know that I'm not the only one. No, who's you're not the only that. one. And I said, guys, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Number one, I need to know what the Premier's direction is, whoever the Premier is. What's their direction with the government? What are their policies? And what do they want to do with the province? And most importantly, what do they want to do with health care? <laughs> and what role do they want me to play in it? I said, I told these young newbie MLAs, they're first term MLAs, I said, guys, I'm an old dog. I've done this, we're not, I've done this rodeo before. And I said, hey, if they want to privatize health care and hack it to pieces, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I'll beat the snot out of them again. And you probably don't want me sitting with you. Because if I run, I'm going to work my buns off and I'm going to win. I won as a liberal and as a cons- conservative in, Medl- in Medlark, which is now Hende West. I would run there. Yeah. So if I wasn't successful, it all depends who the premier is. I'd have to sit down with them, ask them what their priorities are, and ask them what they want of me. But if they're going to lie, and they're going to cheat, and they're going to change their mind after the election, I'm gonna, they're going to know absolutely well, I will beat the snot out of them, politically speaking. And, hey, I've earned my credentials and they, don't, they probably don't want me sitting with them if they're going to lie to you and do something different the day after the election. So I want to turn to the very last question because we are coming up to the hour mark and I want to make sure I get this in. You are running for the leadership of the UCP. You need signatures. You need donations. Uh, you need people to get involved in your campaign because campaigns only work with volunteers. So my first question is, A, how can people reach out to you to learn more about you? Because we've talked a lot in the last 45 minutes, but I guarantee you there's one question that someone's listening to this later on or who's listening to this right now saying, why didn't you ask this question? And I want people to make sure that they are able to reach out to you. So how can they reach out to you? But two, how can people sign your nomination form? How can people donate to your campaign? Because $175,000 is needed to uh, get into the raise. You need a thousand signatures. So how can people do that? So I would ask everyone, please go to electraj.ca, E-L-E-C-T-R-A-J.ca, and uh, click the red button, sign the nomination form. If you're a UCP member, that's enough. But if you don't have a political membership in the UCP, please click the blue button where you can buy a $10 UCP membership, or go to unitedconservative.ca and buy a $10 UCP membership. You can Google my name, and there's a lot of articles about me, what I've done in the past. Politically, um, I don't have a ton of stuff on the website right now other than a nice letter. We're going to post something on healthcare, very comprehensive. I think it's 21, 23 point plan. It's, it's a living document that is not yet finished. I just put a whole bunch of stuff. I tweeted it out on, uh, on Twitter at uh, Raj Sherman on Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter and see what I put out on healthcare. Um, you know, give us a couple of bucks. Uh, I don't want to go to rich guys to ask them to cut me a $4,000 check, and I don't want to be beholden to rich people. Then they come asking for a favor afterwards. I'd rather have regular work donate me 25 or 50 bucks. You know, if you donate 100 bucks, I think you get a $75 tax credit. So go to electoraj.ca, sign the nomination form, and buy a $10 membership, and give us a couple of bucks if you have it to spare. If you don't, that's okay. I'll, uh, I'll maybe have to hit up some of my doctor buddies to invest in democracy. And um, we're just going to get out to the people. I need a 1,000 signatures. I, ha- I only have about 400 because I'm one of the last people to enter. And I don't have any UCP party membership lists. I have no MLAs endorsing me. So guess what? Whoever supports me, I'm going to owe you. I'm going to fight for you. <laughs> and I'm fighting for the regular common working folk because that's who my parents were. That's who my brothers are. And uh, that's who most Albertans are. And frankly, I want to put power back in the hands of the people. That's the most important thing. There are too many political lobbyists and backroom boys, and they know who they are, and they know I know who they are, and they know they're going to have to compete for contracts and not get paid much for them because I'm a cheap East Indian. I'm going to get Albertans value for money from industry, from unions, and we're going to get to world-class services. I believe in five years from now, if I'm given the opportunity and the privilege of serving you as in the ultimate position of service, And I'm telling you, I know the job. I know the gig. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of criticism. And it's a lot of travel and a lot of sleep deprivation. 30 years of trauma medicine has prepared me for this. And I've sort of done phase one of this rodeo before when I was in government and an opposition leader. I'm prepared. I'm ready. I'm healthy. And I have the full support of my family and friends. Please sign up. 
for at electorage.ca. Help me get nominated. And then if the party lets me run, I know some insiders don't want, want me to run because they're concerned that I was a liberal and they're concerned about my political toughness because <laughs> party insiders are not going to get easy money from the premier. Okay? Yeah. And they, and they're welcome to listen to this. And I've told them to their face. Compete like anybody else. And uh, just because you help me win an election campaign, you're not getting a government contract. Go compete. We're going to have open public tendering of contracts with double-blinded bids. How's that for fiscal accountability? So if Raj Sherman, if I'm given the opportunity to govern, we're going to unite the province. We're going to have a diversified economy, knowledge-based economy. We're going to invest, I'm talking 3D printers manufacturing plastics, another refinery. We're talking pharmaceutical companies manufacturing drugs in Alberta. We're talking a pipeline, a transportation utility corridor to Churchill, where we buy Manitoba's hydroelectric power late at night. They got 17 dams when it's cheap and very cheap and it's environmentally friendly. And we send a pipeline over there to Churchill, the grain port, double hull tanker our oil to the Irving refinery so they don't have to get it from Venezuela. And we send negotiators to Quebec, really good negotiators. Let's not say bad things about our brothers and sisters in Quebec. You know, let's cut them a deal. We can give them a few cents on the dollar. But if we get that, if we get that uh, pipeline to, to that uh, Hudson Bay, hey, we might not need an oil pipeline through Quebec. Let's get a pipeline through Prince Rupert and go through Alaska. Let's go straight up north. I'm looking at getting three pipelines done and maybe even the deal with Quebec. And the Americans... Well, I want to get that one done after we get to Tidewater because I want world price from the Americans. I don't want to give them our oil at 60 cents on the dollar. I want to give it to them at 90, 99 cents on the dollar. And you know, we need open, honest government. I would have free votes on the floor of the House and a voting record for every MLA. You would know what your MLA voted for. You shouldn't have to whip that many votes as a leader. I didn't whip any as liberal leader. If the MLAs can't agree on the speech from the throne and the budget, they're probably in the wrong damn party. Okay, seriously. Yeah. Um, lastly, there's only a couple of votes that where you'd say, guys, we need a major infrastructure project done. I want a maglev train from Edmonton to Calgary stopping in Red Deer going at 200 miles an hour. And I want to build Edmonton up to 2 million people and Calgary up to 2 million. Let's build up, not out in those cities. And those city leaders have to get their act together. And they have to densify along the major transportation routes where these expensive LRTs are in. And let's have an NBA, NBA franchise in Edmonton and an NFL franchise in Calgary. Let's bring paying customers here. Let's look after our citizens first in healthcare. In fact, let's overtrain doctors and nurses. And then we can help the rest of the country do their hips and knees and cataracts. And let's bring paying customers from the United States and the Middle East to come get world class healthcare here. We have one electronic health system. We could be the data factory, the research capital for the world on healthcare research. This is what I'm thinking healthcare is black gold. And let's do more with the oil and energy sector and the agriculture sector. Let's diversify that. Let's get more value. Let's not be in a rush to get that oil and ship it out. Because, you know, I grew up in Squamish. We worked in the mill. The mill's gone now. What's happening? The logs are going over, overseas. We're buying them back at five times the price. And good jobs have disappeared. With the Raj Sherman government, we're going to do amazing things. This province was... Go to heights never seen before. I've learned from the lessons of Premier Lougheed and I've learned from the lessons of recent Premiers that I've failed to deliver. And I've done a lot of reading. I've asked lots of questions. I've listened to a lot of people. I'm ready to govern. So please go to electoraj.ca and please help me get nominated for the party and tell the party to let me run in the election. I told Travis Taves, I said, Travis, are you a chicken or what? Come on, let me into the debate. If you want to be a premier one day, get past me first because Notley, Notley's a really smart, she's a lawyer, she's been premier. I said, Travis, come on, you guys who didn't want me running, let me run. Let me challenge you in the debate. If you can't beat me, you can't be my premier. Yeah. Or anyone else's premier. And I've been told I won the 2012 debate way back when, when I was a newbie, newbie leader. Against Redford, right? And uh, Brian Mason and Daniel Smith. Yes, that's right. Um, 
I want to thank you so much for doing this. But I want to start with this to my audience who are listening to or who are watching this. Um, the links to Raj Sherman's uh, website to sign the nomination form to buy a membership of the UCP, to uh, follow him on Twitter, to ask him these questions are in the show notes. So if you scroll down right now, if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to this live by the website, scroll up or down, depending on which one you're on, and you can actually click on the links there and you can find them because this is the time when you need to get involved. If you are not a member of the party, get involved, get a membership. Uh, I believe you have until Thursday next week. It's Wednesday. Wednesday. It's D-Day for our leader. It's D-Day for our team. So Wednesday, by next Wednesday, or so let's say this. Tuesday, you need to have your membership bought, and or well, you need to buy a membership, and then you can sign the paperwork. Or if you're a sitting member already, get Raj on the ballot, and then you can go to his website, sign his nomination forms, and then he can submit his documentation and his money, and donate is on the website as well. So please, if you haven't already, go check it out, because I'm a strong believer in democracy, and I'm also a strong believer that all voices need to be heard. That's where the show comes in. We always love having a diverse group of voices on the show. So, Dr. Raj, Raj, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. It has, and Chris, and on the political spectrum, to the audience, the only one who threatens former Premier Notley on the political spectrum that breaks her coalition, to stop the NDP from forming a socialist government with $100 oil, is me. The Red Tories are sitting on their hands in Edmonton, and half of them are sitting with the NDP. And as the Blue Rib Liberals. Not taking anything away from the current group of candidates that are running. I've got the experience from government and opposition. But on the political spectrum, to prevent an NDP majority government, I'm the only one who sits in that political soft center, little left of center socially and right of center fiscally, to get the UCP a majority government with a representation from Edmonton and Calgary. Yes, rural Alberta we got, but we got to win Edmonton and Calgary. You know, we got to get MLAs from all cities. We can't just get 39 rural MLAs and five Calgary MLAs. Come on, that's not representative of the province. Yeah. Edmonton's missing out in government right now. We need five MLAs from Edmonton. We need a bunch from Calgary. And yes, a bunch from rural Alberta as well. So thank you. No, and I thank you so much. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to another great live edition of the show. Um, please tune in all this week. We have other great episodes coming up. Uh, I want to remind everyone we are off next week. So not this week coming up, but next week we're off. And get out from behind social media and go have a conversation with somebody. I know that's hard to do in 2022, but go talk to somebody because it makes our society better. It makes our democracy better. And you'd be surprised as Raj and I were just talking about how much we have in common compared to what divides us. So go have a conversation. So with that, everyone have yourself an excellent day. And remember, keep talking.